I'm, um, <laughs> I don't know what you think. I don't know what you think. So the, the, the screws came out? Yeah. This could be, this could be a big finding actually. This could be a really big deal. With a camera this time, but, oh yeah. All right, that's it. No, no question now. I broke the prop. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a laceration. So you want to fly over people? Well, today is the day that the regulation changes. And guess what? This is already the most misunderstood regulation out there. No, you can't just fly over people anytime you want. And this is what we're going to talk about in this video. And uh, if you're flying as a recreational pilot, no, you can't follow this regulation. This is only for part 107. So if you have one of these drones right here, then you're going to have to ask yourself a few questions. The Mini. The Mini is one of the most misunderstood. Now we have a bunch of Minis in here because we're going to be doing some testing later on today. But the Mini in itself does not qualify to fly over people. Now you're going to say category one, all of this, we're going to get into the details of category one. But I wanted to get this right out the bat for the video. If you have just a Mini right now, it is not going to be compatible. Now if you have a Mini and you have prop guards on it, is it compatible? Can you fly over people anytime you want? No. And we'll talk about the details of that in a minute. People have been saying, what about my Mavic Air 2? This is a Mavic Air 2 right here. What about my DJI FPV? What about my regular FPV drone right here? Can I fly over people? We'll get into the details of this. The short answer is no, not at the moment. So this new regulation about flying over people is great, but there's a lot of buts behind it and you need to make sure that you really, really understand this stuff. So let's get to it. So the first thing you're probably wondering about is what does the regulation actually say about flying over people? Now this is brand new. This is starting April 21 of 2021. If you're actually watching this video on the day that it is going out, this is the day that you can start flying over people, but stop. You do not fly over people anytime you want. We've already said that in the introduction, but I want to make this clear. The FAA came up with this classification of category one, category two, category three, or category four drone. Your drone has to fall within category one, two, three, or four before you can fly over people. At the moment, at the time I am recording this, there is no category two or category three drone that are approved by the FAA on the market. So you need to slow down. And anytime we talk about cat two or cat three, you need to remember, make sure you check to see if somebody has come up with a category two or category three drone. Category one, we're going to talk about it in a second because there is a few types, a few types. And the most popular one that you can think of do not fall into category one. So at the moment, as this is going live, as you're watching it, chances are you cannot fly over people just yet. So let's get into this a little bit more and take a look at the categories. Now, Category four, I'm going to already take it out of the picture. This is for drones that have been approved by the FAA with a very specific process. I want you to think about category four as much larger drones that have specific maintenance, somebody working on these drones. Think about maybe Amazon doing their deliveries. That's going to be our category four drone. But category one, two, or three, are going to be important. Now, there's a few things that we need to define first. And the first one is the type of flying that you can do over people. The FAA doesn't just say, okay, go fly over people and that's it. They actually have to divide us into different categories. So uh, the first thing is going to be sustained flight and then transitioning flight. Those are the two terms that are being used in the regulation and we're going to talk about what they actually mean. The FAA also has a term called open air assembly, and we're going to define that term as well because you'll see it depending on the type of flying and, and over who is going, to is going to change the type of requirement that you have. Now, I can already see you looking at me and be like, oh, is this too complicated? Yes, actually, this is probably one of the most a complex and complicated piece of regulation out there. And that's also the reason why people don't really understand what is going on. And the first definition we need to look at is sustained flight over people. Sustained flight is actually pretty simple. It's exactly what you're thinking about. Hovering on top of someone or moving vehicle, that's going to be considered sustained flight. Now, another thing that you may not think about is flying back and forth. Even though you're not standing directly 
always on top of someone. If you have a large group of people, for example, and you go back and forth, back and forth, that's going to be considered sustained flight. So when I mention sustained flight, just remember these, these few key terms. The last one is circling. When you're circling permanently over a group of people, even if you're not always flying on top of them, if you go on and off, on and off, still gonna be considered sustained flight. Now you're gonna say then what is not sustained flight? Well, the other category is what the FAA talks as transiting or transitioning between point A and point B. And really what they wanna see there is that you're going over people or maybe over moving vehicles and that you're not really, this is not the intent of the flight if you want. This is not the purpose of the flight. The purpose, let's say that you were, for example, doing a real estate shot and you have to go from one house to the next and you have to cross a busy highway. Well, that is not sustained flight. That's just basically a transiting between point A and point B. Now, obviously, um, if you're going to do this back and forth several times, then at, a, at one point it becomes sustained. So uh, there, there's a very fine line between these two terms, but this is important. And the other term that's important is what the FAA calls open air assembly. And you're going to say, well, Greg, I'm sure it's defined somewhere in the regulation, right? Well, guess what? It's not, which means that open air assembly, it is defined, I shouldn't say that, it is somewhat defined in here, but it's one of these terms that the FAA is gonna look at it on a case by case basis. If you remember the regulation from part 107, if you've studied part 107, at one point the FAA says sparsely populated area. Well, what is a sparsely populated area? Guess what, there's no real definition. If you ask a hundred different pilots what sparsely populated different uh, area, you're gonna get a hundred different answers. And this is, I feel, is this is gonna become kind of the same thing. Now the FA does provide some guideline and, and the way that you should look at it is like this, okay? What is the density of people in a certain area? Let's say that you had, you know, 10 people right next to each other that are elbow to elbow and in, in, in this environment, this is probably not something that we see a lot, right? Uh, but um, 10 people, 15 people elbow to elbow in a pretty small area. That's going to be an open air assembly. If you have a beach in the middle of winter with two or three people on the beach, that's not an open air assembly. Spring break on the beach, that's an open air assembly right here because there's gonna be a ton of people. So you have to think about, hey, if there's a lot of people in one location, that's gonna be an open air assembly. Um, the question we get all the time these days is, what about a wedding? Well, yeah, a wedding is gonna be considered an open air assembly. You get a lot of people here. Now in the regulation, it does talk about the fact that if it's a public event with quite a few people, it's pretty much automatically going to be an open air assembly. You have a parade, for example, you have uh, a, a protest, you have anything that's gonna gather a lot of people. You have a, a ball game going on, a football game for a high school, for example, that's gonna be an open air assembly. So we'll talk about some examples in a minute when I'm done uh, def defining all the different categories. I'm going to give you a whole lot of examples because I feel like this is how you're going to understand how this is going to work. Um, there's one more thing that I want to define is a vehicle. And the FAA is pretty actually uh, direct about what an actual vehicle is. And it, they're basically saying that it's a mean of transportation regardless of whether it is motorized or not. Obviously a car, a truck, a bus, anything of that nature is going to be a vehicle, but a bicycle is also going to be a vehicle. Rollerblades, you bet, vehicle, a surfboard, whatever it is that is basically helping a human move is pretty much going to be considered a vehicle. A train is also going to be considered a vehicle. So all of these things you need to think about, hey, is it transporting humans with or without a motor? It's pretty much a moving vehicle. Why is this important? Because the FA has slightly different rules when it comes to uh, flying over moving vehicles. And we'll get to that again in a second right here. So you're probably asking, what is category one, two, or three? How do I know if my drone is a category one, two, or three? Well, let's take a look at the requirements for this. And I want you to really pay attention here because, uh, well, because it's on you. You're the pilot in command. So when you fly over people, you are making sure that you do have all of this equipment right here. And again, I said it before, but I'm gonna say it again. This is only for uh, part 17 pilots, this is not available to a hobbyist. So let's take a look at this first one, the weight. The weight limit for category one, the category one has to be under 0.55 pounds, which is 250 grams, which means that um, 
Everything attached to the drone, and this is important, has to be under 250 grams or 0.55 pounds. For category two or three, anything under 55 pounds is okay. So in this case, you know, you can have larger drones uh, and they'll fall under category two or three, but category one is very restrictive with the amount of weight. Eligibility requirements for all of these categories, two, three, one, two, or three, you need to have no rotating parts that are creating laceration. We'll get back to that in a second because we actually did some testing to find out, well, if props can actually create laceration. So we'll get back to that in a second. The next thing is, uh, the other requirement is for category two and category three, they are kinetic energy requirements, which means that uh, a certain amount of energy created by the drone. We have 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy for category two is the max and 25 foot pounds of kinetic energy for category three. We'll have a discussion about kinetic energy in a second, just so you can have a better understanding. And then we'll give you some numbers that we actually calculated and, and, and give you a better picture of all of this. The next one is probably one of the most important one, but that people don't quite understand at this stage. It's the paperwork from the FAA. The FAA is gonna have to approve these category drones, at least for category two and three. For category one, you as the pilot in command are going to be the person deciding if the drone meets category one requirements, and then you can go fly. For category two or three, you can't do that until the manufacturer of the drone is going to submit paperwork to the FAA to say, hey, is this okay to fly over people? And the FAA is gonna tell the manufacturer, well, you tell us, what kind of testing have you done to make sure that this actually works? And the manufacturer is gonna come back and say, well, we've flown over people, we've crashed one over, and then we've done this and this and this and this. Do you agree and are you okay with it? At which point the FAA says, good to go, rubber stamp, now you are category two or three. So. At the moment, I've mentioned this, but I'm gonna say it again, there is no category two or three drone as of April of 2021 that are approved by the FAA. It's gonna be a while before we do, so if you're asking, is my Mavic Air 2, is my Mavic uh, 2 Pro, is my Hotel Evo 2, is my Inspire 2 all approved for category two? It's not, okay? Not until DJI and the FAA says, not until Hotel and the FAA do the work to get this approved. I wanna make this, again, very, very clear. And there's gonna be a labeling requirement. For category one, you don't need to have a label, but for category two and category three, you're gonna to need to have a label that says that the drone is right here approved uh, to fly as such. All right, we are gonna be testing as our first test, the Mini, this is the original Mini, and we put some regular props on it. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna test it. Here, what we have is we have our setup. We have something that is actually um, skin-like, if you want, human skin-like. We try to find something as close as we can, and this is what we have. So we have a small area that we can use, and we're gonna fly this into that area. And then we're gonna see what type of laceration we have. So let's get to it. This little drone is a champ. There's not much of a, of a surface area, unfortunately, to hit. I mean, it's barely, it's, it feels like it's barely cutting the, the skin. Let me do it a little faster. Dude, that thing, did you see what it did? It spun right back into the right direction. Oh, finally. You can see. That one did break through the the fat, the fat tissue. Yeah, that that's that's fattier muscle tissue right there. Through that is through the skin layer. I don't know. No, no, I mean right. I'm gonna use the tip of my knife because it's tight. Right there. Yeah, but. Right there. <sighs> Ooh, that's a tough conclusion to get to. Let's do it one more time. Uh, let's wait until. That was a good impact. That was an impact. That folded the arm. You see, it folded the arm on the drone. Oh, that was, that was beautiful. And it's spin, you see how it spin? I don't know, man, I, I swear, like, 
groundbreaking skin in my opinion. I, I've, I've got a hard time saying that this is laceration. Let's, uh, let's land. Let's take a shot. Wow. All right. Well, let's tell you what. Let's uh, carbon it up. All right. Step number two. We're going to try carbon fibers. Step number one was really not conclusive. So I want to go back and I want to look at this footage a little bit closer. But uh, let's try step number two with the carbon props on the Mini. And then let's see what it actually does. That was an impact as far as the aircraft is concerned. Which is weird because it hit really slowly. Was that too high? I don't think so. You want to go check real quick? Yeah, it doesn't sound all that great. Oh, that was it. That broke the prop. Um, I'm, um, I don't know what you think. I don't know what you think. So the, the, the screws came out? Yeah, both the props are fine. I don't see any screws though. All right, carbon prop, unconclusive. All right, we're gonna try again the Mini on a different uh, piece of uh, testing over there. And then we're gonna see what happens. The first test was fairly inconclusive. So I wanted to test this as many times as I can. We went slowly, we went fast, and now we're gonna do it again. Same normal propellers. We're not gonna do the carbon propellers. They don't sound good. The, the airplane is not really all that stable. So I don't really feel comfortable flying it with the carbon props on. But just with the regular props, we're gonna see what happens again. So let's get to it. Yeah. Oh, that was a good hit. I don't think it can get any better than that. Oh, that's, oh that's, that's much deeper. Yes. That is much deeper. Then that was there. Yeah. I'm looking at that. Well, that's another one. We haven't touched this one yet. That was there. No, no, no. This one right here. Oh, 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 I see the cut now. Yeah, yeah. Let's and see. right here. It's there, there, and there. Uh, let's do that again because that's uh, that's that's a much yeah much much deeper laceration now. Oh, that was another good one. I hit it right at. Oh. Wow. Oh, that's that's a, that's a laceration. Okay. Well. Um, yeah, that that's a very very different result right here on the second pass. Hit it twice right on. Now we have lacerations, and, and this is there, there's no question right now. On the previous one, when we ran it into it, um, it, it was really questionable. You, you can barely see the skin. I mean, I would say, you know, if you ran your your, your hand on, on top of concrete and then you come out and you get a little bit of, of skin abrasion, that's what it, it looked like. Now with this pass on the same test with the same drone at pretty much the same speed, we've got a completely different result. So um, we're going to do it one more time and then see what we get out of that one. Well, I pretty much hit it with the camera this time, but... Oh, but that's okay though, because... Oh, yeah. All right, that's it. No, no question now. No, oh, look at that. No. There's no question. There. Yeah, there's no question. All right, well, so when we talk about lacerations, it's pretty clear, it's pretty straightforward right here. You do need prop guards to put on your drone. So let's go back to the studio and do that. So now, because of the requirement to not have uh, rotating parts that create laceration, then for most drones, we're gonna have to have prop guards. And um, you may ask, what about this thing? So this is a Mini 2 with prop guards on it and with a battery. Well, if you put all of this together, then what you get is a drone that's almost 300 grams, which means that it, do, it no longer qualifies as a category one. Now there's a little trick. And the little trick comes from the back right here. And if I take this battery out. Now this battery right here is a battery from Japan. The uh, DJI decided to release a drone in Japan, uh, a mini drone in Japan, that was about 50 grams lighter than the one sold in the US. And the way that they did it, the drone in itself is actually the same thing. The way that they did it is they actually used a smaller battery. This battery is about 49 grams, which is actually half of what the battery for the original uh, mini is. 
And so when you do that, when you have this, this, this spe special battery right here, then the entire drone now all of a sudden becomes a sub 250 gram drones with no rotating props that can cause laceration. So this is the solution right here. This, as it sits right here with the battery in it, with the card in it, is about 246 gram, which makes this a category one drone, one of the very few in the US that can actually fly over people because of this little battery in here. Now you're gonna say, well, where do I find this battery? Well, to find this battery, it's, uh, well, it's painful. It's painful because DJI doesn't sell it in the US just yet. I'm, I'm not sure that they ever will, but at the moment it is not available for sale in the US. So we had to go through hoops to get this thing here. Uh, it took us actually buying an entire drone. Now you notice this, it says 199 grams right here on the side. That's because this is the Japanese version of the Mini 2. And, uh, and this thing is basically, um, just ready to fly over people at the moment. So unless you have one of these and then you have the smaller battery in the back, at the moment, you Mini and you Mini 2 do not qualify as category one, which means you can't fly them over people legally. Now you're gonna say, what does all of this mean? When can I fly category one? When can I fly category two, three? What is the actual regulation behind it? What are the limitations? Well, um, because it's complex, we divided this into four different parts. And the four different parts, the first one is sustained flights over open air assembly. Remember, we defined these terms. Essentially, you've got a concert, a wedding, a church function, a concert or any large gatherings a marathon, a fun run. We have a car show. If there is uh, no moving vehicles, there's a lot of people looking at cars. You're gonna fly over them. That's an example right here. We have a street fair. We have a farmer's market. That's also a uh, open air assembly if you do sustained flight. We have a news event, a speech, a protest, something that is going on that gathers a lot of people. You have a college campus, a busy college campus with a lot of students that are coming out of class, for example. That's also gonna be an example right here. We have the beach on spring break where you have a ton of people for an event at the beach. That's gonna be considered uh, open air assembly. Uh, you have anything, if you do corporate videos and you wanna fly over, uh, maybe let's say you wanted to do a picture of a large group of people in front of their building and you decide to fly right on top of them and hover so you can do the picture and show the, 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 the size of all the employees or of the group of employees, I should say. You don't wanna show the size of the employees. Um, that would be a, a sustained flight right here or uh, a high school uh, event with sports and you have people that are sitting and you wanna fly over them and hover, that is going to be another example right here of sustained flight. So I hope this makes sense. Now, if that's the case, then what you need to do is you can only do it if you have a category one or two and you have remote ID. So that's probably not gonna happen in, in the short amount of time in the next couple of weeks, maybe even months. If you do it with a category three, you can't actually because that's not allowed. It's just, it's an open air assembly. You can be over that. The second type of operation over people that you can do is sustained flight over moving vehicles. Somebody riding a horse, that's another example. You go sustained flight over skateboarders at the park or uh, let's say an off-road event like the Baja event, you have a racetrack with racing vehicles on there, then that's gonna be something where you need, uh, you're gonna be doing sustained flight over moving vehicles. You have a boat uh, that is moving over the water, that's gonna be considered in here. Anything with watercraft really is gonna be a considered moving vehicle, so you have to be uh, paying attention there. Surfers, kayaks, canoes, paddle boards, you name it. Uh, you have, uh, let's say that you had a road with a lot of traffic and you're doing sustained flight right on top of it, then uh, that's gonna be considered in here. A, a ski slope with a lot of skiers going down if you're gonna be doing sustained flight again. Uh, now, so you're gonna ask, well, what about all these examples? What do you need? Well, it doesn't matter one, two, or three. You need to be in a restricted area and you need to be with people that are on notice. Now this is difficult. If you have a busy highway, how do you do that? You can't, you cannot do sustained flight over a busy highway at the moment because it's not allowed by the regulation. It needs to be a restricted area. So you need to think about all these things. When you start flying over moving vehicles, the regulation changes completely and, uh, and, and you need to be aware of this part. 
The third scenario that we have is sustained flight anywhere else. If it's not over open air assembly, if it's not over people, so let's say maybe flying over one or two people in, a, in an area that, you know, the beach during the winter where there's not a whole lot of people, then you can do that. Now, can you do this right now with this drone? Absolutely. This is the one thing that you can do with a category one drone that is under 250 grams. You can basically fly over uh, people anywhere else than the other things that we mentioned. If you have a category three drone, it gets a little bit more complicated. You're gonna have to be inside of a restricted area, just like what we mentioned before for flying over a moving vehicle with people that are on notice. Or if you're not doing this, then we can revert back to the old regulation, which is you need to be, uh, people need to be inside of uh, non-moving vehicles or they need to be under a, a covered structure like inside of a house or a little patio or something then in this case you can fly technically it's not really over them but uh, but if they're inside of a non-moving vehicle then you're good to go to do that so uh, that's the third category now the fourth one is basically the transitioning remember you go from point a to point b uh, without really uh, having the purpose of flying over moving vehicles or people then in this case yes you can do that uh, you can even do it doing it over open air assembly without remote id and you can also do it over moving vehicle with a category one or two so this little thing right here i can theoretically fly over a highway uh, that's a busy highway as long as my purpose is to go from point a to point b to get to where my mission is taking me um, i can also do this over a concert maybe let's say that i'm shooting a house right here and i'm recording another house right here for a photo shoot and then i have to go over um, a parade or or a concert uh, i know this sounds like very uh, not something that would happen but in this case you would theoretically be allowed to do this now if you wanted to do this with a category three it gets a bit more complicated as you can see here in the um, in the cheat sheet that we're providing you uh, yes you can do that but uh, you have you cannot do it over open air assembly because you're not allowed to do this you cannot fly over open air assembly at all with a category three and uh, if you were to do it over moving vehicles you'd have to make sure that they are again in a restricted area and uh, that they are uh, on notice you're gonna say, why all the restrictions on category three? Well, remember the category three drones are the ones that are gonna cause the most damage, 25 foot pound of kinetic energy. So that's a lot of damage right there uh, that can be basically the FA looks at, hey, this is a pretty high risk. If this thing falls, it's gonna hurt people. So we wanna make sure that they are over a restricted area and make sure that the people out there know what's going on and that they're willing to take the risk of being under this uh, larger drone that can create more damage. So I know this is pretty confusing. I know there are a lot of examples and a lot of different possibilities, but please, 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 at the bottom right here, we're gonna put a link to a cheat sheet that you can print. It's gonna fit on one page and you can basically print this put it in your bag, in your flying bag, and refer to it when you need to fly over people or over moving vehicles. And it's really, when you start looking at this cheat sheet, it is pretty straightforward because you need to just see, are you falling in one of these four categories? And if so, what kind of drone do you have, category one, two, or three? And, and then it will tell you what you need to do to be compliant. But don't just go fly and, and, and disregard this regulation. This is important. The FAA has decided to relax the rules a little bit in, when it comes to flying over people. And the last thing that we want to do is take advantage of this in the wrong way and, and create additional regulation for uh, the future when the FAA says, well, this was a terrible idea. We're going to go back to the way it was before. So uh, just, just be aware of all these things in here. Now, let's go ahead and go to the field now and take a look at what flying over people actually means and what, what the FAA meant with all of this. A lot of people are asking, what it is to fly over. Well, over really with the FA means over. Jason here, part of the operation, here's what we're gonna do. We have our Mini 2, which has the prop guard, which has the small battery, which means that it is technically a category one drone. So we're going to be flying on top of Jason, and this is one of the operations that we can actually do. So if we go right on top of Jason, just like this right here, then that qualifies as over. If I go forward, it does not qualify as over because now the drone is not directly over Jason. And really it is that simple. This is what people have been getting confused over. When the FAA says flying over people, flying over moving vehicle, as long as there is any 
part of the drone covering any part of the person. Jason, please extend your arm. If Jason extends his arm to the side like this and I fly over the drone and I fly over Jason, over his arm, I'm flying over Jason, okay? And it really is that simple. So what we're gonna be doing is, there's another thing that you need to consider. As the drone is moving forward towards someone, you may not be flying right on top of them, but what happens if you lose the motors, if the battery loses power, if something detaches, if a propeller breaks, and the drone continues to move forward and then falls on the person. Well, technically you can get in trouble for that as well. So this is something to consider. You may not be flying directly over the person, but because of the moment, because of the, 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 the velocity of the drone, then this is something that you have to consider. So that's what flying over actually means. So let's move on to the next category. All right, kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is really just a fancy word for saying how much energy is this thing creating as it moves through the air. And, uh, and really, this is a number that we need to be paying attention to. Now, we did, we did a little bit of math and, uh, and we found some interesting stuff. The Mini 2, this is a Mini 2 right here. Based on the speed at which it can fall or at which it can fly, and based on its weight, we find that an impact from this drone on someone is gonna create about 26 foot pound of kinetic energy. And, and this is a lot because if you remember, 25 was the limit for a category three drone. So this means surprisingly that this drone, when it hits something or someone, it generates 26 foot pound of kinetic energy. Now there is a way to go around this. And the reason we did all of this math and the reason I'm talking about kinetic energy is because we need to prepare ourselves with what it's gonna to take to make a drone a category two drone or a category three drone. And what it's gonna take is a parachute. If we look at data that's provided by some parachute manufacturers, we're gonna take this drone or a larger drone like a Mavic Air 2 or a Phantom 4 or an Inspire, and we're gonna put a parachute on it, and it's going to reduce dramatically the amount of kinetic energy that it can create uh, when it impacts. So a Mavic Air 2, which weighs 570 grams, is going to generate about 80 foot-pounds of kinetic energy without a parachute. When you start putting a parachute on it, it brings it closer to five. Five is very, very respectable in this case. A Phantom 4, much, much bigger, 1.3 kilos, 1.4 kilos. That's gonna generate over 1,400 foot-pounds of kinetic energy without a parachute. With the parachute, we're down to about eight to nine foot-pound of kinetic energy. So a big, big difference. And, um, and, and, and what this really means, the bottom line with what we found here is the fact that when you buy a category two or a category three drone in the future, essentially what you're gonna buy is a drone that has a parachute attached to it. There's really no other way around the regulation. So for those of you that are asking, when is my Mavic Air 2 going to be a category two drone? Well, it's gonna be a category two drone when the manufacturer says, in order to comply with this regulation, you need to put this kind of parachute on it and then it becomes a category two. But at the moment, this is not where we are. I'm predicting the future right here. I may be completely wrong, uh, but at the moment, based on the research that we did, it looks like to get a category two or three, you're gonna need to have a, uh, a parachute install on this drone. Which takes me to the conclusion. And the conclusion is not really straightforward. You, you've seen the results that we got. Personally, I think that this drone right here without prop guards creates lacerations that are not acceptable uh, as per what the FAA puts out. Which means that um, you need to put prop guards on your small DJI uh, Mavic Mini or any really other drone that's gonna be very similar to this in order to comply with category one. When you do that, it's gonna take it over the maximum weight allowed under category one, which means that you need to be creative by having a smaller batteries or prop guards that are virtually weightless, uh, which is gonna be very difficult. So at the moment, very difficult to say that this without prop guards counts as a category one drone. Um, category two, category three, at the moment we're recording this video, not gonna happen until we have a parachute installed and we have the FAA basically saying, hey, this is approved as a category two drone uh, after DJI, Hotel, all the big manufacturers do a lot of homework with the FAA. So that's the conclusion that we have. Go out there and be safe. If you decide, if you decide that the conclusions from our video is that this drone without prop guard is safe. 
if that's your conclusion and you decide to go and fly, you're taking a risk. And I want to make this very, very clear. If you decide to take that risk and you hit someone in the face, you hit someone, you hit somebody's baby uh, and, and they decide to go after you and, uh, and these lacerations are enough that a judge looks at it and says, yep, you created lacerations, you broke the regulation with the FA, then it's going to cost you a lot of money. Your insurance, if you have one, is not going to cover what you did. you at risk of losing everything that you own. Personally, not something that's worth it. So you need to be you need to be aware of what you're doing when you decide to fly. You are the pilot in command who's going to decide whether this is legal with or without prop guards. It's not me. It's not anybody else. It's you as the pilot in command that's going to say, yes, this meets the, re the, the, the regulation and the requirements. Personally, I'm going to be flying this thing over people Sometimes, not all the time, because there's still a risk. And, uh, and I'm going to be using the small battery that we got. And that's really the only time that I'm going to do it, because otherwise it doesn't meet the requirements. So with that said, I get off my soapbox. I hope this was uh, insightful. I know there was a lot of information in here, but I didn't want to do just a short video because this is not what we do. I wanted to do the research behind it and really explain the, the thought process that we, we got behind all of this. So I hope you made it all the way to the end. Uh, if you did, leave a comment. You probably already did. Um, you know, I always tell my students, uh, any comments, questions, rude remarks. So leave them down here if you have, even if you have rude remarks um, about what we did. Maybe you want to see more testing and we can do that. We can go out and do more testing uh, on the, uh, the piece of equipment that we got and, uh, and hopefully maybe find different, uh, different results. I'm not sure. But uh, that's it for now. Subscribe, like, leave a comment and uh, fly safe and I will see you next time. You ready? That's it. That was so childish. <laughs> but it is so much fun.